So welcome to the November on track uh, session about understanding storytelling beyond the buzzword. A few housekeeping things here first. First, I wanna definitely give a shout out and a huge thank you to our sponsors for this program, Monona Bank, TDS, H. Kruger and Associates, and Total Wine. So without their support of the chamber and these events, uh, we probably, they won't be possible. So we really appreciate um, them don't, you know, helping the chamber to keep, keep uh, those programs running. So other things to keep in mind, uh, I know we've all been on a zillion Zooms at this point, maybe even a zillion today you've already done, uh, but that slash through the microphone uh, means that you're on mute. We would ask you to stay on mute um, unless you're asking a question or sharing some feedback. We will have time for a Q&A. Uh, also with your camera, we do encourage you to turn that on if you can. It helps with engagement to know that we're talking to people and not to a big black screen. Uh, please feel free to utilize chat. So we'll be monitoring that throughout. So if you have a question, please type it in there or comment, feedback. Um, chat is there for us to utilize throughout the whole program. So we will be recording this session today. So if you guys want to rewatch anything or um, you know share it with someone that maybe couldn't attend, you'll be able to do that. I'll be on the Chamber's YouTube channel later. And at this time, I would just love to introduce our speakers. So First Story Media was founded by Dave and Michael in a French cafe in Austin, Texas in 2019. Fueled by a great baguette, they discovered a common center in their work, storytelling. Dave's history in business and marketing helps clients to reach their audiences, and Michael's background in film and its unique power to tell a story and reach an audience. What more does one need to start a storytelling business in the worst economy since the Great Depression? Since then, they've built a highly talented collective of storytellers and collaborators from the worlds of marketing and filmmaking and have served clients from international corporations to local businesses and nonprofits in telling their stories to build connections with their audiences and customers. So gentlemen, at this time, I'd love to turn it over to you. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. You know, I've been a part of the chamber for quite a while. We've been members for about 10 years now and uh, was on the board uh, for about six. It's been fantastic. This is a kind of a, a photo from uh, one of our, our shoots um, or at the end of one of our shoots, our wrap on a, a recent documentary film that we had done that's called Beyond Human Nature. You can probably find that at some point in the near future on a, on a live streaming uh, platform uh, that you probably already have. Um, so watch for that. Um, and we're in the midst of doing some other uh, documentary film projects as well. That's, that's kind of the creative side. That's where Michael's comes from originally. And then, you know, we came together really out of bringing that aspect to the idea of helping businesses as well. Um, my background's more on the sales business and marketing side of things. And, uh, you know, realized that in, in, at the time of like 2009, things were getting really difficult to be able to reach people the way we had been doing it. Uh, the world was fundamentally changing, but the world of social media and other things, and our minds changed with that. And we need to be able to, you know, acknowledge that. And if we want to form relationships, which is what business has always been about, um, we need to be able to reach people a little bit differently versus just selling features and benefits all the time. And that's kind of what this comes comes to point. I wanted to just share this. Um, and this is there's been multiple studies on this. This is just one of them. That uh, ninety you know ninety five percent of purchasing decisions are subconscious and they're they're emotion driven. And, and part of the studies of this is when they actually study people's minds, when, when a person's mind is, is damaged in the area where our emotions are formed in our brain, we actually can't make decisions. So it's one of those things, when you really think about it, we oftentimes a business want to focus on the, on the data and the features and benefits of, of what we do. And essentially, we're talking to 5% of our, our decision-making process. So we're kind of ignoring what we really need to be able to do. Once we're connected to people in, in, in an emotional sense, that we relate to, to what they're sharing, and that they've acknowledged the fact that, that, that there's a motive match between what we're trying to, we're both trying to seek out of a relationship, then, then we'll hear those things. But if we don't, if we don't address that fact in, in the part of building relationships, then we're gonna, we're gonna miss a lot of what we're trying to achieve. So, so what we're gonna bring today, and Michael will doing, be doing a good portion of this presentation, is really just some of that process, that, that thinking, some of the science behind storytelling and why storytelling is not just a word. It's be, it has become somewhat of a buzzword. We think about whenever we're just talking about ourselves or we're talking about our history, we're telling a story and we're really not. Um, so we want to kind of bring forward what, what really defines a story. And if we get it right and we get that structure right and we understand how it works in people's minds, how it can become an asset for us in all of our engagements, both internally when we're trying to manage our businesses and talk to our employees and staffs and things of that nature. And then the obvious thing of building relationships externally in our marketing and in sales area. So I'll let Michael kind of go from here. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, as, as Dave said, my background's in, in film production. Uh, um, and so when, when we started story first, uh, uh, together, I brought kind of the, the production and, and writing and then screenwriting kind of side of everything, um, uh, to the other half that Dave brought, which was his background in sales and marketing and, and working with clients and tr trying to tell stories for a purpose rather than just entertainment. Um, you know, when we're telling stories for brands and for businesses, you know, it's not just about making the audience feel something. Um, it's about actually trying to inspire some sort of action beyond whatever that feeling is. That feeling has to lead to some actual behavior in the audience or else the, the business story is, is, a, is a failure. Um, and that, that fundamentally uh, uh, folds on to any kind of storytelling for influence of any kind. If we're talking about storytelling for nonprofits, if we're talking about storytelling for cause related organizations that we're talking about storytelling for political organizations anything where you're telling a story with an end in mind where the story is a means to an end um, it's not the end in itself um, that's a slightly different muscle than than telling stories purely to move an audience so um, uh, but it, it all comes from the same stuff because stories don't change and that's that's kind of the most comforting thing that I can maybe offer all of you today in, in a world in which we all, all are kind of dealing with changes all the time. And I'm not just talking about COVID. I mean, we were talking about this before COVID started, you know, the, the, the you know, social media and everything, it, it doesn't, uh, it's changing all the time. So, um, so we'll, what, I'm gonna try and emphasize that storytelling is something that doesn't change and, and that you can rely on. Specifically though, three things that I'm hoping you take away today. One is why making your audience the main character of your story rather than your business which is a, an, an early kind of beginner's mistake in brand storytelling, why making that subtle shift changes everything down the, downstream from that decision. Um, you, all of your stories are fundamentally different the moment you decide to make your audience, the, the people you're trying to persuade the main character. Number two, the qui um, we're gonna give you the quickest tool we've ever heard of to turn basically any block of text into a story or at least get you on the first step down that road. Um, and number three, we're gonna give you the best tool we have for differentiation uh, through storytelling, um, because uh, oftentimes, it, as as a screenwriter, I would often be put in the situation where I have to figure out how what I what if I'm writing a western, how am, how is my western different than anyone else's western? So it, it, we have, we have differentiation in art as well. It's just not spoken about quite the same way as it is in business. But the tools we employ in entertainment still apply uh, when you apply them to business. So we'll get to those. Um, so. Let me move along. I've got two laptops going, so this will be this will be a fun, dexterous uh, uh, effort for me. Um, so, like I said, um, I'm, I, storytelling is the thing that doesn't change. We all this this was our reality prior to COVID, and it will be our reality post COVID. Not just social media. Social media is the biggest, most impactful kind of piece of this, but technology in general is just changing all the time, and so how many of these talks are we going to where the premise is some version of here's how to handle this new thing that you don't understand because it came out yesterday. Like that, that's, that's kind of the, the framing for so many of these talks because that's the reality is that that technology is changing all the time. And so you never feel like you really get on top of the latest thing until it's no longer the latest thing anymore. And there's something else now you got to kind of figure out. So you always feel like you're kind of running with it. Um, and that's a real challenge. That, that, that's, a, that's a real thing that we all have to deal with. Dave and I deal with it with Story First. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that everything is changing. There are some foundational baseline things that don't change. Um, uh, but even outside of social media and outside of technology, you know, there's, uh, you know, we have nonstop institutional failure throughout the years. You know, we always, we always and this is not meant to be a super cynical slide because because I, I believe in, in the strength of institutions and, the, and, and it's not that things are always failing, but they're never, they, you know, you never know what to expect one year to the other. I mean, the thing, things are always going to be up and down. You know, there's kind of that ongoing meme uh, every New Year's, it feels like we kind of have the same meme that we do on social media about like good riddance 2018, worst year ever, good riddance 2019, worst year ever. And of course, we're all going to do that in 2020. Question is, do we say that again in 2021 or did COVID cure us of that? I have no idea. Um, but we all kind of do this thing every year where it's like, oh, you know, there's always a reason that this year was so destabilizing. Um, and, and there's usually some good reason behind it, but it's, you know, it, it, the point is that doesn't stop. That's, that's constant. You're always going to have some sort of instability thing going on. And this obviously uh, affects business for, for very clear reasons. Um, the things that don't change, though, tend to wrap around storytelling. Stories, stories are something that we have been doing as human beings 
since arguably 200,000 years ago. It's, it's the earliest thing, but this is why a lot of poets will say that storytelling is actually the very thing that makes us human. It's the thing that makes us different from other animals is that we came to be able to communicate our inner lives and our external lives in the form of narrative. Um, and so you, you go all the way back 200,000 to maybe uh, 150,000 years ago was the, the dawn of oral storytelling. Um, we, this is all stories were for, for years and years and years and years and years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, some of our earliest stories that we know about, the Epic of Gilgamesh being one of them, uh, or the Enuma Elish, these are tablets that we found kind of pieces of over time that were just oral stories first written down. Um, uh, and, but they, but they, they barely exist in intact and every once in a while a new version, a new piece of a tablet will be discovered somewhere. Um, earliest art form 40,000 years ago, this would be the, the cave paintings uh, of Lascaux in France um, uh, and, you know, written communication. We've only been writing our communication to each other for six to 7,000 years. Um, 2,000 years ago is when argument, persuasion, logic, and rhetoric started. So at the tools that Dave was talking about earlier that we, that we typically kind of first go to when trying to persuade someone, either in business or something else, we've only been doing those things for 2,000 years. Not, barely a fraction of what we've been doing, how long we've been doing storytelling. Um, and then reading and writing en masse only, a hun only hundreds of years ago did we start doing this as, as a... As a as a mass group of people. There were, there were more, you know, reading and writing happened obviously with more elite people before that, um, uh, going back to 6,000 and 7,000 years ago. But on mass, it's only been hundreds of years that, that human beings have been reading and writing. This is relevant from an evolutionary standpoint because what it, you only get something really worked into to a species if it's been doing it for a very, 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 very long time. Um, so, so, you know, oral storytelling, is our earliest way of communicating with one another. So because of that, we have actually evolved to hardwire our brains to perceive raw incoming, raw incoming sensory information from our five senses in story terms to make that easier and quicker because it became an adaptive trait. So uh, it made it easier for our ancestors to survive if they had a storytelling instinct. So when we walk down the street now, you will filter out uh, 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 a whole bunch of things that are in your, that your, your senses are picking up, your, your conscious mind won't even think about them because they're expected and they don't, they, they're, they're, yeah, you know, the, uh, it's a cold day. So I feel cold. I don't think about it, whatever. What you'll notice are things that jump out, that break a pattern, that are things that kind of lead to storytelling principles. Um, uh, and so that's why stories are so impactful is because we're literally organizing information in a way that installs into the story mind easily. Um, so this is, this is something that you can rely on. It's it, new social media comes out, some new destabilizing thing happens. It, it's always going to, in some way, relate back to this. You'll always be able to do this dance on that new platform, storytelling on TikTok, storytelling on uh, Facebook, whatever. It's always going to be this underneath. And the only question is, how do you do that dance on the new platform? But it's not a question of doing some different dance. So... We've had, uh, uh, for a long time, very little actual research on storytelling specifically um, uh, until about 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, the research arm of the Department of Defense actually started putting real money behind it um, and researching story, the effects of storytelling on the brain uh, as part of the war on terror, essentially, and as part of just geopolitical concerns. Um, if, if the United States wants some particular country to, to, you know, uh, to, to think of something in a different way, uh, they wanted to be able to put that, that geopolitical messaging in narrative form and see how that could affect uh, uh, their efforts. Um, you, you would start noticing maybe, I, I, at least I did, maybe about 10 or so years ago, I started noticing more and more politicians using the word narrative, like explicitly, where they would start saying things like, we have the stronger narrative, we have the greater narrative, talking about geopolitical things. You hear this at the UN a lot now. People will say like, the, the, our, the, the narrative of X country is stronger than the narrative of some other country. Um, I only started noticing that about 10 years ago, but it, but I, I know it's been a conscious effort on the part of the United States, at least um, since about 16 or 17 years ago. Um, and so we'll get into some of the research that they came out with, uh, and more so just their conclusion, because it's really helpful. It, again, they're just telling stories to influence like we are. Um, so we can apply this exact same stuff that they're using to our own businesses, because we're after some sort of impact. We're after some sort of change in behavior by changing the way people are taking in the information rather than just putting out raw cold information and hoping that they 
that they take it the way we want to. But before this, before we had all this, most of our information of storytelling came from artists and artists like Trey Parker and Matt Stone from South Park. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, a very different tone from from uh, uh, from DARPA, um, but they they actually had some really great storytelling instincts. And they, I don't know if you don't know about how South Park gets made, they do a whole new episode in six days every time. So like they will they will go their their air, their show airs on a Wednesday, and they will not know what that episode is uh, the Monday before. They, they will, they or, 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 I'm sorry, the Thursday before. They will start on that Thursday before not knowing what's going to air on Wednesday and they will be start writing, start writing, and then they'll be animating and everything. And they've even said that if you looked at an episode that airs on a Wednesday, the day before on that Tuesday, that it, people will be shocked at how little there actually is. So, I mean, they, they do this so quickly and so regularly that they've actually developed some really good tricks of the trade to try and get storytelling quality uh, in a quick time. Um, and this is the, the best version of that. So the bottom line, uh, in the beginning, blank, but then blank, therefore blank. So this is the rule of buts and therefores, and it comes from Trey Parker, the, the creator of South Park. Um, the idea being that if in any block of text, it might be easy at this point to think about it in terms of like your about us page on a website or something. If you think about that, or about if you ever wrote out your company's history or something, you want to, a lot of them will be written initially as this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened sort of things. Um, the rule of buts and therefores is replace all the ands with either but or therefore. So it becomes this happened, but this happened, therefore this happened, but then this happened, therefore this happened. You immediately infuse a causality where something happens that's unexpected, that then inspires a counter reaction that tries to bring about balance, that, but then something else unexpected happens, which then results in this. That's what, that's what storytelling's juice is. Storytelling is not something that's stationary, that doesn't change. Um, and and, and that's, that's a lesson that it, sometimes it's hard for businesses to kind of get their mojo going with because in business, we like predictability. We like to sound like things don't change. We like to pretend like something is like, it's, it's a brick wall and it's still a brick wall in a hundred years and all this stuff. But really human storytelling is all about, we had this great product, but then we realized that the patent expired or something. Therefore we had to send it back to the R and D department to reiterate again. And as a result of that, what came out was an even better product, but then this happened, which then also inspired more innovation. It's that kind of stuff. Um, and, sh and showing showing your audience through this what the process actually was and what, what was difficult about what you did. Because for, as human beings, if something's not difficult, we tend to not think it's terribly valuable. Like it's, if, it, right. if it's not hard, why do we care? Um, but we, we talk about that all the time, about the fact that in, in so many cases, you know, we, we do seek for, for, as, as business people to just put forth this idea, this facade of perfection. Um, and we think about that in any of our relationships. The minute we kind of lean into somebody in a relationship, whether you just meet somebody over coffee, is when they share a challenge that's similar to something you're challenged, you're, you're challenged with in your own life. And that's fundamentally what the obstacle, the barrier, the problem that's within a story allows a story to work for you much more. So, you know, some of the most powerful things we've done for clients are ones where they literally expose their own problem. It's not just about the problem of the process or the challenge in the process, but they literally even expose their own mistakes. Um, or, 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 you know, mistakes that they may have had some impact on. Um, it, 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 you know, people, people will, will lean into you when, you know, that trust factor um, goes up highly the minute that you can say, I'm not perfect. Um, you know, that, that's one of the things, you know, we think about that in other aspects of our world and our lives. When people can't do that, we tend not to trust. So. And, and what you're trying to do, obviously, when you're communicating as a business or a brand, is you're trying to to spike attention. I mean, that, that's obviously a buzzword also right now. Uh, uh, but attention comes from rising cortisol levels in the brain. And the way you get cortisol levels going in the brain is by something happening that's unexpected that stands in the way of, of, of achieving something. So a couple examples that I can point to with this. If you're, you know, if you're watching a, a Packers game and they are just either blowing out the opposing team or being blown out themselves and the end of the game is like 56 to nothing, five minutes left in the game, how invested are you? Like it's, it, you're kind of bored by it, right? But 
if if they win at the last second on a on a fourth and eight, you know, in Chicago, and and it's amazing, and how did they do it? That's because it was hard that it ke- that kept your attention. Like it was something that was uncertain that w- there was something standing in the way, and 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 the the result was not a guarantee. Um, uh, that's that's playing on this exact same thing. In screenwriting, the 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 principle on this is the catharsis that an audience feels at the end of a story is in direct core. If you, if you watch a TV show or a movie, the next time you do this, think about the, you know, the, the level of catharsis or emotion you feel at the ending of the movie. If you feel a lot of it, if you feel like a big release uh, of emotion by the way the movie ends, that's usually because of the fact that it was so uncertain and it was, and it was so tense and it was, it, the, the, the pressure was really on. If there isn't much emotional catharsis at the end, it's because they, they didn't raise the stakes enough. Um, so this all applies to this. This is because this is how our brains work. It's not. This isn't just like a, a thing people thought of because it's fun. It 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 works this way because this is how our brains interpret information. Um, so that that right there is is the the quickest kind of fill in the blank, uh, uh, you know, version of of a story principle or equation that we could give you is that if you just replace in your in your next communication efforts all the and thens with buts and therefores and then see where that takes you, that's a great first step to starting to impose some of this. Um, next, differentiation. Um, same sort of thing with how, how we've only been using rhetoric for you know hundreds of years, maybe a couple thousand years. Um, uh, your services don't define you as much as you might think they do. Um, so these are three examples of building contractors in the Wisconsin state. Um, uh, and we've done a lot of work for building contractors. And that's, so that's why we kind of re- reflexively went to this. But, um, you know, these are just kind of services they listed on their website, each of them. And I can't, I made this a number of months ago now, and I can't, re- I couldn't tell you from looking at them which one's which because they may be all different services, but quite frankly, I'm sure they'd all do all of them if you asked them. So it's, it's just kind of the ones they chose to lead with. So it doesn't really tell you much about who any of these people are, who the businesses are, what are they after, how do they help, help you achieve what you're after. Same thing with kind of the platitudes of we value our clients, we offer on-time delivery. It's like, yeah, but everyone could say the same thing. So these, are un, these, these don't differentiate anything. Um, but, but stories have the same problem. Um, you, you, if, if you make a, 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 a film or a movie or a TV show that's, that's derivative, that kind of feels like the same sort of thing. You make a law show that feels too much like Law and Order. Well, why do people watch that over Law and Order? It's like, you, you got to find some reason it's different. Why would I tune into that one as opposed to another one? The controlling idea is the screenwriting tool for this. And you can apply the same thing to, to your brand stories. So this is, this is our, our best tool for getting into a brand's uh, uh, kind of consciousness, what it is that really actively differentiates them. And we do this for every client we work with. And it's a simple equation. Value at stake is either achieved or not achieved because the climax character performs some decisive action. So these are, these are spots that you kind of fill in different answers to. Um, so it'd be, to give you a screaming example to make this really simple, uh, uh, think about Dirty Harry and Sherlock Holmes. So they're like two businesses in the same vertical. They're both detectives and they're both after the same thing ostensibly. Uh, but we know instantly how different they are. Like you don't, you don't even have to think about it. Like this, this is, we know what separates Dirty Harry from Sherlock Holmes. If they have to face a problem, they're solving it completely different ways. Um, but they're both after the same thing. Um, so, you know, Dir- Dirty Harry and, and, and Sherlock Holmes are both after the value of justice. So if we'd go back to the equation, we'd, we'd put that first part value at stake would be justice. So justice is either achieved or not achieved because Dirty Harry or Sherlock Holmes performs some decisive action. So we've, we've filled it in halfway there. So justice is either achieved or not achieved because Dirty Harry does blank or because Sherlock Holmes does blank. It, in this case, it's, it's, it's isolating what is the act that each of these characters does that, that really reveals who they are because behavior speaks louder than words. Actions speak louder than words. Somebody could say they're for something, but they behave in a way that is completely contrary to that. So in, in the case of these two, Dirty Harry, uh, justice is achieved because Dirty Harry is more brutal than the bad guys in his movies. He out-brutalizes them. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the message of every Dirty Harry movie. Sherlock Holmes, justice is achieved because Sherlock Holmes outsmarts the bad guy. 
and that, that's a completely different character. And if I were hired to write the next Sherlock Holmes movie, I'd better not write a scene where he busts out a magnum, you know, and blows away the bad guy at the end. Because the audience would, would cry BS at that. Because we know intuitively, that's not Sherlock Holmes. That's not who he is. You can see how this applies to a brand or a business. Whenever, especially the end part that I just did about kind of a violation of character, whenever a brand behaves in a way that just strikes us as that's not who you are. What, why did you just do that? That, 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 that flies in that act that you just took that statement you just made that, that endorsement you just made, whatever that flies in the face of what I thought you were as a brand. It, it, it violates for me what this was. Um, same thing, same principles. Um, you know, two building contractors can be completely different. We've done a, uh, work for a building contractor where the, the controlling idea would be something like, uh, um, uh, you know, skylines are, are, are erected uh, because X building contractor uh, really goes after the most difficult projects out there and knows how to, how to do that. Or skylines are built because X building contractor has a legacy of really doing things the right way and, and, and does right by their clients every time. And, and that's how they, people come back to them over and over again. Those are two different stories, two different characters and two different brands. And you can, and when you hear them, you can picture them in a way. You can, you can predict behavior. You can see them more as, as human entities. And so much of this is about making brands feel more approachable like humans, feel, feel like actual characters, feel, feel like things that people can take on and, and wear as part of their own personal identities in some sense, as being customers of it. Correct. Yeah, I think, you know, throughout my career, one of the things that I always realized is, you know, whatever business or organization that I worked for, they'd have a mission statement. But in most cases, I couldn't repeat what the mission statement was. Yeah. And I certainly couldn't in many cases, you know, connect with what it really meant to me and how I needed to act. So we see this, you know, this tool, like I said, it's, like Michael said, it's, it's a tool that's been used in the world of storytelling by, by screenwriters and authors. We see it as, as that unique tool when, when done well, when you really get the right conclusion from it, that guiding light for the people that run the business. It's not something you necessarily have to ever put out to, the, to an audience beyond that. You can if it makes sense to, but the point is, is really to make, uh, give you that guiding decision on how to better act and ultimately tell your story. Because when you're telling your story, it needs to re resemble who you are consistently. So when we know that, we know in the case of this, you know, not to act like a dirty Harry, if you're Sherlock Holmes, um, you know, and I think you can see how it can be defining. I'm thinking about the Middleton Chamber when I think about that, if we were going to think of that we could be thinking about business is better because the Milton Chamber fosters authentic connections better than any other organization. You know that would be that kind of thing. And if you think about that, that kind of thing, and if you're if you're running the organization, you have that as that simple line. You kind of know what your priorities are, and you know what's important. And when you're not acting that way, when you, when you're not doing that, you're probably not doing what you need to do for your business and your and the audiences you're trying to to serve better. So right. it's really, it's it's so uniquely simple, but that's what makes it so powerful. And it's clarifying you, 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 it, it, because usually people get into to differentiation problems when they start trying to be everything to everyone, because then, then, you, then what are you sort of thing. Um, so in terms of using a controlling idea again, to inspire particular action, here's a few examples of what you can do with a controlling idea. So this is an example for an, an online food delivery service, like a, like, a, you know, those services that would be like a box of ingredients and you can cook at your home, that sort of thing. So if they had a controlling idea, Yes, that had fun as their primary value at stake. Uh, and it was something like life's more fun when you can improvise and let go of fear of failing. So in this case, fun is the value at stake. You, meaning the audience, is the main character, which we're going to get to in a second. Um, and when you, the audience, improvise and let go of fear of failing, that would be a clear controlling idea. So it, it shows you that if, you, if that's what you are, here's some behaviors that are encouraged with your product. You, you, let's, let's encourage experimentation. Let's encourage replacing ingredients. Let's encourage sudden changes while cooking, stumbling upon new recipes, so things that are discouraged by this, following recipes strictly, rating a recipe as good or bad with stars or something. Specific measurements and recipes would, would not be encouraged by this controlling idea. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of more possibilities of things you could do. But it's, it's really clarifying when you have a controlling idea like this, who you are as a brand. What do you do that is specific to you that maybe a competitor wouldn't do? Another example, uh, uh, this would be the, the, the example of a, 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 the, the, the building contractor. So long-term success, so success being the, 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 the value at stake here, is achieved when people do right by the customer. So this is a story that centers 
the company again. So people really is a way of saying the brand. So long-term success is achieved when the brand does right by the customers. So doing right by the customers is the behavioral action there. What's encouraged? Long-term relationship building. Time investment upfront without compensation. Investment in the highest quality materials. Prioritizing EQ over IQ in staff. Sacrificing time, money, profit before sacrificing the relationship. What's discouraged and not allowed? Upselling for its own sake. Hiring highly artistic and idiosyncratic architects and designers that make it more about their art as opposed to helping the customer. Social media posts about how great we are, not customer centric. These sorts of things. It clarifies it for you. Uh, this would be a form of a movie theater chain. Um, cinemas are stewards of the classic movie going experience. So this is, this is a, a more of a, it's an implied controlling idea. So the idea here is that, uh, 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 that, the, mo that the classic movie going experience is, is the thing that's valued, the thing that's at stake. And so s cinemas take the action or this cinema in particular s views itself as being a steward of that. So their action is stewardship. We, we're going to steward, we're going we're to be protectors of that movie going experience. What does that mean? State of the art projection and sound technology. Roadshow, st roadshow style programs for every feature film. More importantly, what's discouraged or not allowed? If you're trying to really pr protect the classic movie going experience, don't have commercials before the movie. No more than three coming attraction trailers. Excessively large plush seating that kind of like t makes it more like a living room as opposed to an actual auditorium. These sorts of things, they, they tell you what you're not. Um, and, and knowing what you're not is in some ways as clarifying or more so sometimes than knowing what you are. Um, so these are, these are really, really, really helpful tools, the controlling idea. When you know it, uh, you know how to behave. So that, that's the second thing we mentioned up front and the, the three quick takeaways we wanted you to have is uh, uh, how, how helpful the tool of the controlling idea is for differentiation and telling you how you're different from someone that kind of ostensibly offers the same thing uh, as you do. Now we'll get back to the really good stuff. So this is, this is the DARPA conclusions. So first of all, I just wanted to give you a sense of what the research was that they, that they did uh, in order to achieve this. So the DARPA experiments uh, involved 48 neuroscientists at the time, 24 uh, channel EEG lab that they were working in. Um, and they just had a whole bunch of uh, uh, different test groups go in where they hooked everybody up um, uh, to a whole bunch of uh, uh, the blood reads and, and, and uh, chemical levels. Um, they had video cameras on people so that they could monitor face ex expressions. Um, uh, they did post interviews, pre interviews, one month after interviews with these people, three months after interviews with these people to try and measure memory retention of what people remembered of the stories. And then what they did is with each group that they brought in, they told one of two stories to each group and they would just change one piece of it. They would change one element. So they'd change like who the character was at the center of the story, or they would change what the obstacle was standing between them and what they wanted, or they would change what the cathartic ending was. They would change these little pieces and they would just measure in these test groups what, how did that affect memory retention three months down? How did that affect how they felt about the characters? How did that affect how they felt about the ending? And so what they ended up finding here was uh, uh, some pretty cool stuff. Um, but I'll remind you, first of all, that the only reason that this is even able to be measured is because we seem to have no other game to play. This is, this is like measuring anything else in the human mind. Uh, this is Jerome Bruner, a cognitive uh, psychologist. We seem to have no other way of describing lived time except in the form of narrative. Stories are not a choice. They're not something you do as like among other options we are always telling ourselves stories nonstop every day, all day. And the only question is whether or not the stories that you pick up in the world lock in with your own story mind or if your story mind rejects it. And the truth is that our, sto our story minds, the neural story net is what DARPA calls them, rejects like 99% of stories that come at you in a day. And we all know this about ourselves. Um, so the most effective stories for persuasion are ones that plug in really easily and get through all that, all that, the, the filters that we all carry with ourselves. This is what DARPA came away with. So this is the, we call it the purpose-driven storyline to make it more simple. They call it the neural story net. It's a, it's a physical part of the brain um, that actually interprets raw sensory information into story terms, uh, for lack of a better phrase. So it'll, it'll filter out things that you know, that are, that are kind of givens. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen, um, 
there's a, there's a really famous psych video you could look up on this after listening to this. It's really interesting. It's called the gorilla experiment. Uh, it's a psych experiment where if you, it's a video on YouTube, you can find it's from years ago where you're, it's a group of people in a circle and they're tossing a ball back and forth to each other. And you're supposed to watch the ball and, and, and see kind of where it ends up. And then at the end, uh, 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 they ask everybody watching it, like, you know, what do you, you know, what did you think about what happened or where did the ball end up? Or what did you think of the video? And a ton of people don't notice the fact that a person in a gorilla suit just walked through the room right be right through the group of people throwing the balls back and forth and walked out because our brains filtered it out. Like we weren't, that wasn't what we were paying attention to, but it's right there plain as plain to see as soon as you're actually looking for it. So it, there, there's a number of, of weird psych experiments that show us how much the neural story net just, it, it, it's known, it just, it filters so much out. So the game then becomes, how do you make sure your messaging is not filtered out, that it actually gets through into the conscious mind and sits with people and they remember it three months later, they remember it six months later, yada, yada, yada. This is that. So everything we were just showing before in the, the paradigm earlier with the buts and therefores, there's a main character, pursuit of some goal, there's an antagonist or obstacle standing in the way of that goal, some sort of climax where they either achieve what they're after or they don't, uh, and then some resolution at the end. That's, that's something that artists have known forever. The, re the result of the DARPA research pointed out that the motive or value at stake and the climax character, the character who performs the action that either brings about or doesn't bring about resolution are the two most important ingredients to get right if you're telling stories to persuade. So that's the specific idea, again, that we're not just telling stories to make someone feel something. We're actually trying to tell stories to get a particular reaction, to inspire some sort of belief or behavior in the audience. And if that's our goal, these are the two most important pieces, making sure that the motive or value at stake is right and that the climax character, the character that comes about and makes that decisive action, uh, in the case of the, the examples we gave, Dirty Harry, Sherlock Holmes, whatever, um, uh, that, that, that's the most important thing to get right. Um, if you don't get those two things right, the, the stories tend to fade. They don't, the, the, the memory retention goes away, people's engagement goes down, all that kind of stuff. Um, so here's some brand examples of this. And this is where it'll really become clear how important it is when you center your audience as the main character rather than yourself. So this is an example uh, uh, with a, an, a Saudi oil company called Saudi Aramco. And this was a client of the main researcher behind this DARPA stuff after they finished the research, because they're obviously selling this as much as they can as well now, because why not? It's information we now know about the human mind. Let's do it. Um, so one of his clients was Saudi Aramco, and Saudi Aramco was telling itself a very particular story, like all businesses do. We're all telling ourselves some, some story of, 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 of how we're existing, what, what our business is all the time. And the story they were telling themselves was that Saudi Aramco, the main character, had a motive of hiring skilled labor in the USA, finding some suppliers in the USA, finding research partners in the USA. This was their goal. The things standing in Saudi Aramco's way were regulators that were charged with protecting people and making sure that jobs stay in the United States and a whole bunch of different things. Um, and as a result of that, the person in, in that, with the head, that they had the ability to bring about or not bring about balance in this story was also the regulators. So with this particular story, Saudi Aramco is actually powerless. So the story that they were telling themselves about their situation left them with no ability to really do anything to bring about any sort of resolution here because the people that, that, the people that need to do something are also the people standing in their way. You're stuck. We've all, we've all had that, regardless of how you feel about a Saudi oil company, we've all had that equation in our businesses before where it feels like the person we need to act a certain way is also the person standing in our way. How do we get, how do we get past that? The way you do it is by reorganizing the story so that you actually get what you want. Make the main character the public or the regulators, in fact, because they're, cause, cause the audience that you're trying to, to influence here, you want to influence the public, you want to influence the regulators to do what you want them to do. So start telling a different story. Tell the story about how the regulators, whose motive is to provide and protect for, for the citizens uh, against all the things that wouldn't uh, help the citizens, such as poverty, lack of infrastructure, lack of opportunity, any sort of thing that, that would come as a result of bad access to energy, uh, any, you know, lack of access to, to these things. Um, the regulators are charged with trying to solve that thing, protect the public from those things. How can the regulators be aided in doing that? By engaging Saudi Aramco 
to help them accomplish what they want and bring about opportunity to the people that need it. And so they, they adopted a new slogan that energy is opportunity. Um, and they started telling this story uh, to both the public and to regulators through different branding and marketing opportunities to try and reframe the conversation where no, 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 no regulators and no, no public, you see us as the ones hurting you. We're actually the ones that can help you get where you want to go. Again, re regardless of what you think about this particular company, that's, that's really quality brand storytelling, switching it around because you're trying to influence a particular audience. So make them the main character and show how you can help them achieve what you want, which is engaging you. Um, uh, so that's, that's one example. Um, and by the way, I've seen that, I think we've all seen that uh, in the last number of years, maybe 10 years, um, uh, with a whole bunch of, of brands that kind of have iffy, uh, 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 I don't know what you'd call it, like brand images in some sense. So like, you know, after the, the GE or the, the, the oil spill, um, uh, who, who uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the company yeah. now. Say again? Wasn't it, I think it was Exxon, wasn't it? Or? No, it was um, British, British Petroleum, BP. Yes, so right, BP, BP, after the oil spill, BP started telling a whole bunch of stories about how they're not the problem, they're actually the solution, right? I mean, so it's, it's, you can be cynical about it, and I am as well, like everybody is. But the point is, I still see, I see what they're doing. Like, I see, <laughs> I, I see the, the effort there. And if, you, if they didn't have such a big hurdle to overcome with the reality of what happened there, uh, uh, it might be actually really effective. So it, it, the, the, the tools are morally neutral, it's, it, but they are the tools um, and you can use them and become more aware of them by doing it as well. You, you start to see the matrix a little bit. Um, here's another example, the, Gen the Center for Genetics and Society. Uh, so uh, Center of, of Ge for Genetics and Society, you can kind of think of them, uh, they were at Berkeley, so you can kind of think of them as the equivalent of the regulators in the last story. Um, they were charged with responsible controlled development of genetic technology in this case. So it wasn't about energy, but it was about like, you know, uh, GMOs and making sure, you know, any, anything, anything that would, that would, uh, that we'd be concerned about in terms of genetic engineering. So uh, CRISPR, I think would also be potentially something they'd be, they'd be dealing with, but so their charge is uh, making sure that, that there's only responsible controlled development of this technology. The thing standing in their way happens to be the genetic development industry, which has incentives that push them to want to develop and put things out as quickly as possible. Because regardless of whatever the downsides are, we want to have this technology out as quickly as possible. Let's keep pushing for it. Let's keep pushing for it. And the, the regulator, the Center for Genetics and Society, the watchdog is always kind of going against them, kind of saying, no, 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 no. And they didn't like that about themselves. Like the, the Center for Genetics and Society hated feeling like the negative Nancy in the room, always, always standing in the way of things. It, it kind of was a morale killer um, for a lot of their, their group as well, because they, believe it or not, are actually really excited about this stuff too. I mean, they, they don't want to be stopping things, but they're just charged with being responsible about it. So again, this is kind of like an endless, pointless story that has no obvious resolution. So let's move the story around. Let's tell the story to the public about how the public is after acquiring the benefits of genetic technology. They don't want the downside, but they definitely want the benefits of it. So, so the story is the public wants the benefits of genetic technology, uh, the things standing in their way of that would be all the same sort of things not having access to, to, to uh, robust positive genetic development, things like hunger, high cost of food and drug production, pesticides, disease, etc. All these things can be fought with strong quality genetic technology that would come out. Um, who can help this come about? The Center for Genetics and Society. You move them from the main character where they were originally they, they were telling a story where they, where they were thinking about themselves and what was standing in their way. Move them from the main character over into the climax character. The, the, the brand is not telling a story about itself. The brand is the wizard along the way, the helper that comes along to help someone else accomplish what they want. That's kind of the, the, the idea. Um, you're, you're, it's not about telling your story. You know, I understand why brands and businesses frame it that way of like, you know, we want to tell our story better. Absolutely. But your story is your audience's story. And you, you, the brand is helping the audience accomplish what they're after. That's the brand story. Um, because that's always going to result in you telling stories that actually uh, uh, plug into your audience's neural story net and actually shows them how they fit in, how you fit into their life. Um, so if telling this story, the Center for Genetics and Society isn't standing in the way of genetic technology development. They're no longer the naysayers in this story. What they are is they're trying to foster 
the, the, the acquisition of the benefits of genetic technology to the public. Um, uh, and, and, and they started telling a, a different story through their marketing where they weren't the brakes. If you use the, an example, like a metaphor of a car, they were no longer the brakes in the car. They're the rear view mirrors that show you kind of where you've been, where you're going. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're the GPS system that kind of show you the map ahead. Like they're all these things that are not stop. They're things that are, let me guide you along the way. And that's a very different mindset for a brand to have. Um, and it completely changed the, the morale of the company. Uh, from the inside out. Here's one from a company that we worked with, um, uh, Bank59 uh, out of Oconomowoc. Um, they originally, they, until very recently, they were called First Bank Financial Center. Um, and their, uh, their goal, the story they were telling about themselves was they were after delivering financial services and products to their constituents, their, com their, their customers and the, the communities in which they worked. The thing standing in their way of doing that, national and world banks, too many banks with similar names. That's a really big one. First Bank Financial Center sounds like every other bank out there. They've been around forever, which is why they didn't want to change it. They had a lot of equity built into that name. But good Lord, the, how many banks have the words first or bank or financial or center in them? There's so many. So it's, it's completely, it's hard to differentiate based on that. So this is also a story that kind of has no end. Like there's, there's no obvious solution to this. Um, uh, you know, who, who, who takes an action to solve this for them? You know, what, 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 is, what is the issue? Um, so they, 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 they wanted to tell this story though. Uh, they, they decided what they were going to do is they were going to change their name to Bank59. Um, and they wanted to tell that story in a way that showed to their audience the right message about that. They weren't being bought out. They weren't changing their name because of something that was changing. They were changing their name because of something that their audience might care about. So the main character became Main Street. This is a, com a community bank. It's a large community bank, but it's still at, at core a community bank. So they're, they're, they're thinking a lot about Main Street as their main character. Uh, what's Main Street's goal? To preserve that Main Street culture. We don't want Main Street to change so much that it no longer resembles what we like about it. By that culture, we mean people who live there work there, uh, that you walk into a shop, someone knows your name, um, that, there, that it's not a whole bunch of uh, uh, multinational groups or, or you know, big store chains that take over everything. It's all local. Um, so we want to preserve what Main Street, what makes Main Street Main Street. So that's what Main Street's after. What's standing in their way? local institutions shuddering would stand in their way. If, 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 if community banks like First Bank Financial Center went away, they will be replaced by the, the, you know, the big banks. They'll be replaced by a Wells Fargo, for example. Um, and that, that goes against preserving that Main Street culture. So who can help Main Street maintain that Main Street culture? First Bank Financial Center can by taking the decisive action of changing their name, which, which allows them to differentiate better to uh, uh, bring in new business in a way that, that makes them feel refreshed and more kind of modern. Um, and, it, and it allows them to go into the future more competitive and therefore holding back the, the shuttering of local institutions uh, uh, at, the, at the Bay. So this is, this is a story that they can tell about changing their name to their audience that puts the name change in the right context and the right narrative for their audience. Um, again, the main character is their audience. The main character is who they want to think a certain way, who they want to behave a certain way, who they want to act a certain way. So that's, that's a, a, the second to last example. One final example of this, uh, because I think it's really helpful. This is just during COVID. So Jester King Brewery is a, a, a microbrewery in Austin, Texas that I'm a big fan of. Um, and they were having a problem during the initial shutdowns in Texas because the laws in Texas uh, are pretty strict for liquor sales. I mean, they, their liquor, liquor stores aren't open on Sundays, believe it or not, in Texas and a whole bunch of things like that. So um, they, they, one of the specific things they couldn't do though is what, during the shutdown, they couldn't deliver uh, beer, uh, their product, either via the mail or direct to direct deliveries to homes. They couldn't do that based on Texas law. So they, they had no way of selling their product. So the, the story they were living, because this, this was really high stakes, if you remember back in March, the, the real high stakes was, uh, uh, you know, we are just a King brewery and we're trying to preserve our business through this. Cause right now we can't sell anything because the laws are a certain way and we can't bring people in here to buy it. And how do we sell our product? The things standing in their way of doing that were the stay at home orders and the governor of Texas who had those laws and, and ostensibly had the power to change those laws. And that was the problem too, is that 
the person you need to take action here is either the governor of Texas or the legislature in the state. So again, they're in a completely powerless situation in this context. The people that are standing in their way are the very people they need to do a certain thing. So how do you do that? Let's change the narrative. Let's talk a different way about this that maybe plugs into our audience better. Let's make the governor of Texas our main character. Let's make the Texas legislature our main character. What do they want? They wanna preserve the Texas economy through this. Uh, what's standing in their way? The economic ruin through the stay at home COVID orders, all those things that we've been living with for the last number of months. How can Jester King Brewery bring about a, an aid to help them achieve what they want by advocating for shipping beer nationwide? We, as Jester King Brewery, along with the Texas Craft Brewers Guild, uh, are looking to help preserve the, the, the Texas state economy through this difficult time by advocating that they allow the temporary or permanent shipment of beer nationwide so that we can still get our products sold and maintain a vital part of, of Texas uh, uh, beer economy and the economy in general. Um, and the resolution from that action would be the survival of, of the Texas economy, or at least one part of it. Um, this is how you reframe what you're after as something that helps your audience accomplish what they're after. Um, so hopefully through these four examples, it's, it's shown you that the power of, of taking yourself out of the main character position and putting in the, the, the people that you're talking to, it really changes every decision downstream from that. From, what you're, from the story you're telling. You're no longer telling a story about yourself. You're not risking actually talking about yourself that much. You're, you're actually gonna be talking a lot more about them and what they're after and how you can help them accomplish what they're after by doing what you want them to do. Um, so this is, again, like I said, a morally neutral tool. It's just part of the way human beings work. It's how we interpret things in the world. Um, but this to me is part of almost media literacy at this point. Like if you start knowing how this stuff gets framed, it, you start to see the matrix and you start to know you start to see it when it's being dishonestly employed, but this can be implied or, or employed honestly in the exact same way. I mean, that, that's what we feel both with the, the uh, Jester King example and with Bank 5-9. Those weren't lies. I mean, those, those, are, those are real things. I mean, they, they, it, 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 they're just framing it for a different audience. It's not a lie that it's bad for Main Street if local institutions shudder like that. It's, that's not, it's not a good thing for preserving Main Street culture. So here, that's a benefit of them changing their name. It's not a lie that if if a Jester King Brewery can't sell its product at all and they go out of business, that that's not good for the Texas economy. That's not a lie. That's true. Um, but it's but it's it's not a, it's not the most important way of framing it for your own head. It's the most important way of framing it for the audience you're trying to achieve. It's a different priority set, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think I think, you know, I think in the case of most of what we do in most of our businesses, it's really just putting a priority on on, on your customers and, and what is most important to them. Mm -hmm. It's it's actually being thoughtful. It's saying, you know, I have all these different ways I can help somebody. What's the what's the one that matters most to them that matches the motive in which they're trying to achieve something? And when we put that forth, we're just we're just making it easy for them. None of us want to listen to a lot of things we don't care about. It right. doesn't mean that you can't authentically help me. We're just getting to get to some degree. We're cutting to the chase and getting to the point that matters most. And right. Putting in the framework of a, of a story that's relatable that says, yeah, that could work for me too. Yeah. So I know we're, we're running up against the last few minutes. So this, this is, these are the five questions essentially that we're asking with that, that neural story net framework. Every time we're engaging just versions of these same questions, who are we talking to? What do they want? And how does that match what we want? What's standing in their way? What would solve that for them? And how can we help them? How can we be that thing that solves it for them? You're just asking those questions over and over and over again. Roger Ebert referred to movies in his mind as empathy machines. I think you can extend that to this tool. It's an empathy machine. It actually forces you to ask questions about what matters to someone else and how can you help them accomplish what they want. Um, that's, that's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the ultimate, if we're talking about like, uh, uh, you know, things, problems as big as depolarization uh, in politics today, this is a great tool for that. How do we frame, how do we talk to each other? How do we think about what the other side wants? How do we think about what they, what's stopping them from getting what they want? All these things, it's, a, it's, a, it's an empathy tool and stories are all about breaking through and building up empathy. So in conclusion, these are the three tools we've tried to have you come away with today. Why making your audience the main character changes everything. The quickest tool to turn anything into a story, that rule of buts and therefores. And that best tool for differentiation, how, which one are you, Dirty Harry or are you Sherlock Holmes? It's all about figuring out what that decisive action you're taking that actually reveals the character more so than the mission statement or what it is you're saying. So thank you so much for, uh, uh, for joining us here today. And uh, yeah, we can, we have a little bit of time for questions, obviously. 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael and Dave. We really appreciate that. At this time, like Michael said, please feel free to type a question into chat or you can take yourself off of mute to ask it. We would love to hear from you. Absolutely. And I can't see chat. So if anyone, if someone does, yep. I assume we'll see it somehow. <laughs> yes, I would be happy to read those too. Uh, we're asking if you guys are open to sharing your slides after today. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. If you want to send them to me, and mm -hmm. then you guys, everyone that attended will get a follow-up email from Kristen with um, this and the recording and all that stuff in it. So thank you. I have to say, I think I learned more than three things, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, great and, to hear. Uh, you know, it's an interesting time. We oftentimes do, you know, uh, get into the conversation, other kinds of talks that we do, where we yeah. talk about the reality of story in our everyday lives. You know, we see it as a tool for life. And yep. when you understand how it works, you do, you are able to manage some of the things that we deal with every day in our lives. And obviously it's, it's probably more real in our, in our lives today than ever, because we are, we are, you know, as Michael said, we've been hearing narrative from a lot of places that we necessarily don't always believe. So when we're, we're being told stories that we may not believe, if we understand how they happen and why they happen, it, it is a very useful tool from that perspective. But from business, quite frankly, it polices itself. That's the one most wonderful thing about it. If we can't, if we can't tell authentic, real stories in business, it's gonna, it's, we're gonna pay a price very quickly. So frankly, you know, we, when we've been in business now for almost 12 years and have never once had a client ask us to tell a story that we felt was inappropriate or wrong or a lie, it just doesn't happen. So I'm not saying that, that people don't do it in business, but I'm just saying it's not a prevalent thing um, and it's, it's never good. So, yeah, um, and I think and I think when it does happen, it happens more by accident than by intention. Right. I think I think it's because people break the process and don't realize that they're violating their story when they are. Um, and yeah. so that's that's one of the things that we hope to help people with is to show them what's around that corner so that they don't do that to themselves. Sure, I think everyone's just anxious to go change all of their ands and thens to butts mm -hmm. in their horse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a huge one, without right? a doubt, without Easy. a doubt. You know, I mean, think about it. I mean, one of the things that I think is one of the most wonderful about um, the Milton Chamber is the GMM events and the networking events, right? But let's be real, right? We all have all had that person every once in a while at a network event that gets in front of us and starts talking about themselves. And they basically say the and then, and then, then, and then, then, and then, then. And we're all looking to bail out of that conversation, right? Yep. So when the first one, when you're meeting somebody who doesn't do that, they're actually talking about a problem or a challenge, we're, we're, we're drawn in and we're, you know, we lose 15 minutes and people are telling us to sit down because, the show, you know, the GMM is about to start you know that's that's what happens so there's a power in uh in, in just changing that structure in the way that we communicate for sure all right well Ooh. any other questions from the group uh, we'll hang out here for a few more minutes if you'd like to chat yeah. or take yourself off of mute um thank you to you guys for for taking time out of your schedules to present to the to the membership um it was I, I thought it was great. So I'm hoping everyone else did as well. And thank you to everyone that, uh, that attended. Um, one more shout out to our sponsors, Monona Bank, TDS, uh, H. Kruger, and Total Wine. And then I did pop up on the, on the screen, or Michael did for me, um, the next two upcoming chamber events. So um, we have an economic development next week. And then we'll be back December 3rd with our uh, last Get Movie Middleton of 2020. So thank you guys. <laughs>